Okay, we are at the at the end of this conference, and we have but but one more uh, speaker. And in the interest of time, I'm I'm going to very very much abbreviate uh, the introduction to Dr. Tyson. But I urge all of you to read uh, uh, Neil's bio in your conference notes. He is truly an amazing an amazing gentleman. Uh, just one word, uh, one thought by way of introduction. Uh, he had an a an article in the Prade magazine, the Sunday supplement that they stuff into your paper, uh, and. For the first time, my wife uh, read what Neil had written, and she said, I now understand what you do a little bit at the Jet Propulsion Lab. Why can't you make your job as exciting, as relevant, as important as Neil made it sound in his article? And my answer was, because he's a hell of a lot smarter than I am. Neil, the audience is yours, sir. Thank you. Thank you that warm introduction. Uh, that was my very first time writing for Parade Magazine. Uh, perhaps none of you read Parade Magazine. Uh, I never did. <laughs> it, doesn't, uh, it doesn't come in the Sunday New York Times, uh, which is my hometown paper, hailing from New York City. And so uh, I had to write it a little differently from how I might normally communicate with my academic colleagues or even uh, people from the Northeast. Uh, so, <laughs> uh, the title of this talk, talk is the Delusions of Space Enthusiasts. People here, are space, raise your hand if you think you're a space enthusiast. Um, oh, by the way, if you're not otherwise familiar with, with who I am, uh, I play an astrophysicist on TV, all right? That's where I'm most commonly seen. If you don't own a television, you're probably smarter for that fact, but you are way underplugged in to the pulse of what's going on in the country if you do not watch television. So that you'll end up reading the paper and say, how did that happen? Or how did that person get elected? Or why is that going on in the Middle East? That's because 100 million people are doing something that you're not. So it leaves you disconnected to what's going on in the country. And so I just want to appeal to you that if you ever have any ambitions of communicating with the public, some part of your life has to do what the public does, whether or not you agree with what that is. That's just a little bit of advice there. Uh, anyhow, when I'm not playing a scientist on TV, uh, I hail from this institution, uh, American Museum of Natural History, and uh, it's kind of cool because at my office, is this a laser? Yeah, it should be. Uh, my office is sort of deep in there. There's the planetarium, Hayden Planetarium. You're all invited, by the way, in case you've never been. Um, this place is dripping. The design of the facility is dripping with the cosmos. For example, there's a terrace over here where there's inlaid dark granite that would be the eclipse umbra left by the sphere with the light source way on the other side of the park. So it's just it's dripping with with cosmic reference. So you're all invited and come hang out. I want to just, I, I don't, uh, this is the end of the conference. And so I just want to offer a reality check to us all on the things we've seen said, the things we might have said ourselves or to others, and connect that to what actually happens in the real world. This kind of reality check is important for any academic to have, perhaps annually. Okay, it should be your annual reality check checkup. All right, um, if you never leave Pasadena, this is the kind of checkup you should have each year. Um, so, so let's go on. Let's start off with some quotes that I've dug up. These are quotes. Uh, what kind of quotes are they? They would be sort of visionless quotes. We so often we look at the quotes of visionaries and we say, oh, they got that right. Oh how brilliant they are. No one goes back and finds the quotes that are just plain wrong. <laughs> wrong, because those go, get forgotten, of course. And understandably so. You don't hold on to all the things that don't work in the world, that your warehouse would be too large. But, so these visionless quotes are culled from those wrong quotes uttered by people who perhaps should have known better, okay? Or, or circumstances or uh, visionary. So let's, let's start off 
here's one, Brooklyn Daily Eagle. This was a, it was a supplement included at the end of that century to, ref, to celebrate what might be a new century of discovery. It is scarcely possible that the 20th century will witness improvements in transportation that will be as great as were those in the 19th century. Now that's just, that's just being stupid. Um, the, they were riding high, you know, the, the automobile had just been invented, the, the bicycle, the, 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 the railroads were crossing the country, and they were just sitting high and pretty with these discoveries, and were certain that nothing would come to challenge it. So, so just to put us in, we're going to work this up to space in a minute, but I just want you to see how bad these predictions can get. Uh, here we go. Man will not fly for 50 years. Uh, well, who said that? Wilbur and, <laughs> to his brother Orville, right? So they should have known better. I'm sorry. Here, all right. They were working out of their bicycle shop. They were already working on flight at this time. So, all right. Uh, it doesn't stop there. New York Times. Uh, actually, the New York Times is quite famous for, for what the kinds of things we're about to see here. For example, we hope that Professor Langley, who you may remember, uh, was a, quite a, a, an aerospace pioneer and had all these experiments on, on heavier-than-air flight, a whole laboratory to work on this, whole books published on aircraft design. Uh, we hope that Professor Langley will not put his substantial greatness as a scientist in further peril by continuing to waste his time and the money involved in further airship experiments. Life is short. He's capable of services to humanity incomparably greater than can be expected to result from trying to fly. For students and investigators of the Langley type, there are more useful experiments. Now, the aviation folks out there, you know what, when the Wright Brothers first flew? It was December 17th, 1903. So this was seven days, seven days before the Wright brothers flew. Um, I'm particularly sensitive to this because in the year 2000, we opened that facility with exhibitry that did not include Pluto among the rest of the larger objects of the solar system. And the New York Times raked us over the coals, saying, Pluto not a planet? Only in New York. And then my inbox just got flooded. And then two years later, after like Sedna got discovered in Quarwar and all, Quarwar, that's a local, like discovered a few blocks away from here, right? Discovered by people whose offices are a few blocks away from here. And they then came out with an editorial saying, well, maybe they got it right over there at the museum. Meanwhile, I lost a year of my life replying to angry third graders. Um, <laughs> so, <laughs> anyhow, so I, I'm, I'm, I feel this. <laughs> um, uh, no flying machine will, now, so now that they know how to fly, now they're saying, all right, it's just a toy. No flying machine will ever fly from New York to Paris. Orville Wright. So it's interesting how once they, once they get there, they still, they're trying to draw a line. There's this sort of tech line that no one knows how to cross. And it's not just sort of garage inventors, all right? One of our own was guilty of this. Okay, uh, one of our own, F.R. Moulton from the University of Chicago, an astronomer, 1932. There's no hope for the fanciful idea of reaching the moon because of insurmountable barriers to escaping Earth's gravity. You know, so we're not immune to this as a community. You get people making these kinds of comments. All right, so the last of these really stupid ones, uh, Science Digest, 1948, landing and moving around on the moon offers so many serious problems for humans that it may take science another 200 years to lick them. Okay, looking at the data, it took 20 years more to lick them, not 200. All right, so now here's, now watch what happens. This is where the fascinating, oh, I got one more here, sorry. I got one more. Uh, uh, the, uh, Lee de Forest, February 1957, so we're now approaching that with the 50-year you know, time, time range here. Man will never reach the moon regardless of all future scientific advances. Well, of course, he's a radio guy, so it's okay for him to say this, but what's, what's, what's interesting is the date, all right? So this is a few months before Sputnik. It's a few months before Sputnik. Sputnik, of course, October. So watch what happens. 
all of a sudden the space age is born and space travel becomes real. It becomes real. Everything that was previously impossible is now possible. So now we have a set of quotes. People, now they know technology is going to get us there, but then they're, com they're still disconnected from the causes and effects of things that allow an idea to become a reality. So now they start saying things like this. Here's Wall Street Journal. The most same, we've already on the moon, all right? I mean, we're, oh, sorry, the Apollo project is already underway, being funded at NASA, all right? We're going to the moon. Kennedy gave his speech. We're, we're essentially there, all right? So Wall Street Journal says, the most ambitious US space endeavor in the years ahead will be the campaign to land men on neighboring Mars. Most es experts estimate the task can be accomplished by 1985. Okay. So now all of a sudden, the predict they're over-predicting. Their oh, the vision is too, is running, among, is running wild, running wild. And we have to, we want to understand why this is so. It's so because people didn't even believe we could get into space. You get into space, then everybody gets excited. Let's keep going. A year later, the futurist, a manned lunar base will be in existence by 1986. Okay. There's a, now we're in 1980. By the year 2000. 50,000 people will be living and working in space. Now, I checked in the year 2000. That number was three. Okay, so. <laughs> that's how many people were on the space station in the year 2000. Um, so, the disconnect here is everyone sees that we're going into space and doesn't, doesn't pause and reflect on the forces in society that are enabling that in the first place. They just think it's the next frontier that everybody is going out holding hands to breach. They're not thinking, well, we're at war, people. There's a cold war, there's a hot war. The Russians are a whole other political economic system that we're in competition with, okay? And they're the enemy, and so we don't, and they're, they're so this is the mindset that enables the space program to unfold. And that funding, that stream of funding, is went un, un, unreflected upon by all the people who are trying to understand the future, our future in space. And so what I did was, I tried to understand, all right, if we're going to go to Mars, this is back in the mid to late 90s, I thought I was invited to contribute to the Columbia History of the 20th Century Encyclopedia. Okay, so my, my chapter was on paths to discovery. And in that, I didn't know what to write about. I said, all right, let me, why don't I just look through, I don't even know why I agreed to do that, because I didn't have time, I didn't even want to do it. But I was committed, and I said, let me look through time and assess all of the drivers that have contributed to the human species, our culture, that has contributed to our culture's greatest investments of human and financial capital. Let me make a list of those objects. Let me do that. And, and then I could fill a whole chapter. I could, you know, one page per, per driver, okay? And then, then the, I, the, thing, the chapter would write itself at that point. And so I'm going through and I look at the pyramids, and everything expensive. We could agree what's expensive. This is not an argument here, okay? The pyramids, the, the Manhattan Project, the, the, you just go down the list. The, all the, the great voyages of, this, of the 15th century and 16th centuries. And I, I made a list of the drivers. Do you know how many drivers there are? Three. There's not a book full. There's three. Three drivers. Only three drivers. And those three drivers are these. War. That is the biggest driver there ever was. There is always money for war. Always. Okay? The promise of economic return. People always want more. Okay? It's not just an American mental state. It, I think it's kind of fundamental in our, in our genes. Then you have praise of power. All right, so the defense, you get the Great Wall of China, the Manhattan Project, Eisenhower Interstate System. Okay? You know, Eisenhower saw the Autobahn survive troop movements with tanks and bombs and, 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 and serious weather, comes back to the United States, say, I want one of those for us too. And so there's always money to build interstates. And if you look at the specs for it, like 
they go through mountains, not over them and, 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 and under them, and they're these stretches that are straight. Why? Because you can land an airplane on them. So there's a whole defense uh, properties embedded in our interstate system uh, inspired by Eisenhower coming back after having seen the Autobahn, where basically the modern highway system was invented in Germany. So you get your Columbus voyages, hugely expensive enterprises. Okay? I got to tell you quick, you know, in New York City, there's Columbus Circle, which is a, squ a square, uh, and every, well, sorry, no, it is a circle actually, but it's an intersection of uh, two avenues, Broadway and 8th Avenue. But, and there's a statue of Columbus there. There's an annual Columbus Day parade, it, and all of the Italian Americans come out for that parade, celebrating Columbus. You know what I want to do? I want to get up on, you know, I want to get, I want to, I want to stand up and say, go home. Italy did not pay for his trip. Spain did, okay? Had Italy paid for this trip, then South America would be speaking Italian today, not Spanish. So, so there's major consequences to the fact that Italy did not value discovery at that point. There were Italian individuals who did, but not the nation, all right? Spain did, Isabella did, not Italy. Okay, so you go all, you, you just, and we can make the list, and it's only gonna come under these three categories. And here are the powers of two kinds. There's the power of kings, where you get the pyramids. You have the power of God, or some deity that... And so, so this is almost a, uh, what you do is out of submission to the power that, of what it is you are investing your time, energy, and money to create. And so other than these three, I don't know any other driver that creates hugely expensive enterprises and cultures. So I thought to myself, if going to Mars is going to be expensive, and, it, and there is not one of these three drivers, then we're never going to Mars. <laughs> Unless you want to declare that 21st century America is a fundamentally different kind of culture than all human cultures that have preceded us, unless you're ready to declare that, which I'm not. I think humans are the same no matter what. We're the same. And so unless you're prepared to declare that, it's going to have to satisfy one of these three criteria. Now, we know, you just know, that if China said, all it takes is one message from Beijing, we're going to put Chinese military bases on Mars. Bada bing! We're going to be in Mars in nine months, okay? Nine months. We're there, all right? That's all it takes. In fact, in fact I was going to go to Beijing and, and just tell them just to leak a memo. It doesn't have to be true. Just leak the memo. <laughs> we'd be like running around, we'd be on Mars, okay? And in China, of course, Mars is already red, so that, that would work in the marketing. That would work fast, all right? So, so if it's not, well, we don't find like, uh, you know, so if that's not what's going to get us there, then there's a little bit of economic return. Now, there are, there are two kinds there. Is there like oil on Mars? Okay, so Bush will get us there like that as well. Um, but if not, but if not, uh, maybe this, to sustain this would require some kind of plan of tourism. And I've been distant from, you don't see me talking about space tourism ever, because other people, there are plenty of supporters for that. I don't want to overmake the case. All I want to say is, we no longer give money in the praise of power the way we once did. And if defense is not one of the drivers, then if you can't find an economic reason to go to Mars, I don't have confidence in the likelihood of our funding streams to enable that goal. I'm sorry, and it's not my opinion I'm expressing to you. It's a read of history. It's a read. That doesn't mean we don't do science and doesn't, don't fund things. I'm talking about funding thresholds, which when you pass them, it is so expensive that you have to, it, you can't fund it all in one funding cycle. So it has to, you fund it over multiple years. And over multiple years, stuff happens. Political winds change, economic uh, uh, stability uh, changes. And so you have to ask, what among us will survive those fluctuations in economics and in politics? And these are the drivers that do. Other drivers simply do not, and that includes science. I wish that were not the case. I'm just the, the messenger here, okay? Now, um, so what about NASA's funding? What, what about NASA's funding? For me, the most significant funding chart you will ever see, th this is an opinion now, the significant part is the one I'm about to show you, okay? It is the run of NASA funding from, in constant dollars, from birth 
to today. Okay? Now, what's important here is, um, well, the two bits of information to notice. We are a wealthier nation today than we once were. So a, a $15 billion a year funding back then, if you, if you average out this bump into this valley, uh, it's been about constant for 40, for 50 years. So you do a 10-year running average. It was 168, 110, dropped in the 70s. Uh, but if you sort of did a 10-year running average, it, in the noise, it's pretty much constant. Okay? Now, we're a wealthier nation. Our budget is larger. And so to keep this constant over those years meant the fraction of the total federal budget that it represents has dropped. So over the Apollo era, it was, if you average this out, it's about 2% of the federal budget. And nowadays, it's 7 tenths of 1 cent. Um, but my point here is, if, so let's, let's, for the sake of this conversation, say the funding has been flat the whole time. It means between 1960 and 1972, we had Mercury, Gemini, Apollo, and the design of Skylab at that budget. Okay? We got out of low Earth orbit on that budget. And so now going forward, I don't want to hear NASA say, oh, you want to lead, so here, we got a budget here, and we've, we've been driving around the block with the space shuttle, okay? <laughs> Boldly going where hundreds had gone before. Um, and so we say, we need to leave low Earth orbit, okay? Now, I didn't want NASA to sound like the military, because the military gets a $300 billion a year budget, and they say, oh, you want to fight a war that's extra, all right? So I don't want, so, so I don't want NASA to say, oh, you want to leave low Earth orbit? Top me up, okay? So, so uh, if we did it then, I don't see why we can't leave. Now, how far you go, you mean, this is the man program I'm referring to. Obviously, we, we've been out of low Earth orbit all the time with our, with our space probes. Um, but so all I'm saying is that when the vision was announced and it asked for fiscal frugality, it was not a completely unrealistic request of NASA to do so, okay? Because that same budget accomplished what it did. Now, if you can't do it now, you then have to say, you have to confess that you're a little bloated compared with then, or you have more than you need, or you're not as efficient. You're gonna have to, the confessional time at that point, okay? Somebody's gonna have to admit that. Now, of course, we want this to keep growing, and I made a case in that Parade article, which none of you read because you're reading other, mag other magazines. Um, the, <laughs> um, but if you, if you do like Parade, Space, and Tyson, you like Google that, I think you'll go straight to it. But in there, I just casually say, I make the point that, you know, we all know most people who say, oh, why are we spending billions up there and not down here? Well, that's not the right question. The question is, what fraction of the total budget are we spending up there? And when you do that math, there it is, seven-tenths of one cent. And this leaves 99 and three-tenths percent of the rest of the federal budget to do the rest, to serve the rest of the needs of the country. So NASA, not now, nor has it ever really been in anybody's way to accomplish what they need to out of the federal budget. No one would call this in the way. But they have the urge to, and by the way, that is, I know of no higher form of compliment than that. The highest form of compliment is people see NASA's achievements and they think NASA is 20% of the federal budget. That's a compliment. They're complaining about how much we're spending on NASA, not knowing how little we're actually do, spending to get this, the visual results that they see. So, and I had another kind of encounter. We had this great talk about uh, uh, Cassini and Titan. I gotta go off script here and tell you when Titan, when um, Cassini, after its six years of, of on its way out to the outer solar system, when it finally pulled into orbit around Saturn, I got a phone call from the Today Show. And they said, will you come on and talk about Cassini? And I said, what, did I miss some, was there some science that came out that I missed? No, it's that it just pulled into orbit. And I'm thinking, well, why don't you like, hold on until there's real science and then talk to the folks who like, design the stuff and then come back and I'll, if you need to, I'll tie a bow on the, on the story, okay? No, but I, I say that very seriously because I don't want to ever be the person who's delivering 
the firsthand science of what was done by others. That's not my role in this world, okay? I can give them a good sound bite, but only after they've done their homework. And so I'm happy to, to serve that role. But the day I'm starting to give other people's role, that's not the relationship we need to have. And I think I have succeeded in that. I don't do it for the local stations because they don't have correspondence everywhere, but the networks, for sure. So they said, oh no, we just wanted, we heard that it's at Saturn. Saturn's one of my favorite, it is my favorite planet. I said, fine. So I go in the studio, right? And I'm there, it's Matt Lauer. And sorry, this is an aside. It's got nothing to do with the rest of what I'm gonna say, but I gotta say this, because we had such a great talk on this a moment ago. So Matt Lauer's there, and he said, oh, so, I, so tell me what this means. What, what just happened? I said, well, Cassini pulled into orbit, and back in the 70s and 80s, all these space probes were just flybys. You know, you'd spend like 10 years getting out there, and then like a half hour, you know, it's like, did you get it? So, so this was, <laughs> right? I mean, the intensity of those moments was huge because you're just flying by. And the word flyby is kind of fading from our lexicon because you've got ambitious spacecraft that actually can go into orbit. A New Horizons uh, notwithstanding, because I think that will fly by uh, the object formerly known as a planet. Um, but, <laughs> so, he, so he says, I said, well, I want to first congratulate the engineers and scientists who designed this, this mission. Um, and, but it's great because now it'll go into orbit, do these loop orbits and look at the rings and the magnetic fields and the moons. And he, then, okay, so we got that out of the way. And Matt Lauer decided to be hard-hitting journalist. And he said, well, Dr. Tyson, how can we justify this expense? With, um, uh, what was the number? Is it three billion? What's the cost? What's the cost? It's about three billion, three plus or minus. Um, that came out. How can we justify this expense given all the problems we have in the world today? And I said, pause. It's not three billion dollars. It is three billion, but it's like divided into like the 12 year, you know, nominal life expectancies. You got to divide that per year. That's what you have to do first. And the number you are left with turns out, I'm saying this on the air, turns out, is about what Americans spend annually on lip balm, okay? Now, at that moment, like the camera shook and the lighting guys, like, no, there was, like, it was, the, and, and he was, he stuttered. He stuttered, he had no comeback. It was like, oh, okay, back to you, Katie. And that was it, that was the end of the interview. That was the end, and so, and so I said, well, I guess, okay, I'm done here. I guess so I, got, so I go back. Wait, wait. So you may know, for those who own a television out there, that the Today Show on NBC, there's a crowd outside the window looking in. Well, so I left the green room, and I'm, I emerge in that crowd. What I didn't know is the sound gets piped out to that crowd. So they hear the whole broadcast. So I come out, okay? And then the whole crowd goes into an applause, and they hold up their chaps and say, we want to go to Saturn. <laughs> so I said, whoa. So we can like start a chapstick movement, I think. So, so the point is, most people have no clue how cheap all this is, especially when you factor in the return on that investment. And so it helps to have sort of a pocket full of those kind of calculations to make that comparison. Um, so. <laughs> And you all know how to do that math. I don't need to guide you on that. Um, so, anyway, I'm sorry, that was an aside. Can I get that added back to my, my talk time? Is that... Uh, oh, what happened to my thing? Oops. There we go. That was my album covers from iTunes there. So, anyhow, so let's go. So now, so let's just to, to, to convince you that I think I'm getting this right is you get the American space mantra, the Kennedy speech to the joint session of Congress. This is like a couple of weeks after Yuri Gagarin had just come out of orbit. We didn't have anybody, we were like, we got beat in every measurable way in the space program with the Russians. But we remember as Americans, our time back then as being pioneers because we landed on the moon first, forgetting that they had the first satellite, the first non-human animal, the first human, the first woman, the first black person who was from Cuba, the first spacewalk, because the they owned Cuba back then, right? That was their hello in our Western Hemisphere. So uh, the first spacewalk, the first space station, the first dock, docking, the first landing on Mars, 
the first landing of anything on the moon, the first rover on the moon. You just go down the list, and we lost every single one of those contests. And so what we did was we defined what the goal was. And we said, oh, the goal is the moon. And so then we got there and said, we won. OK? <laughs> We're done. We won. That's how we kind of did that. All right. So we remember Kennedy as the visionary. You have people today saying, where are the visionaries? Where is the commitment, the drive that we had in the 1960s? That's all we need today, and we'll be back on Mars tomorrow. That is delusional. OK? Here's, what we, here's the part that we hear and is always retold. You, know, you, you, you can hear the New England accent utter these words as Kennedy spoke to them. I believe this nation committed itself to achieving the goal the decade of landing a man on the moon returning safely to Earth. No single space project will be more impressive or more important for long-range exploration. Okay? That's an important word here for the moment. None will be so difficult or expensive. There is the cost factor. And he's saying, oh, because we're explorers. Oh, that's nice. That's nice. Was exploration on my list of, of, of drivers? No. No. So how, how do you have this word and that word in the same sentence? He didn't say long-range military. He didn't say long-range wealth. He didn't say long-range praise of God. Long-range exploration. How does that work? Well, because you don't hear the other part of the same speech two paragraphs earlier. Two paragraphs. Here's the part you don't hear. Here you go. You ready? Same speech. If we are to win the battle that is now going on around the world between freedom and tyranny, the dramatic achievements in space, which occurred in recent weeks, or Yuri Gagarin, should have made clear to us all, as did Sputnik in 1957, the impact of this adventure on the minds of men everywhere who are to, attempting to make a determination of which road they should take. This is the battle cry against communism. And without this paragraph, this paragraph rings hollow because no one is going to dislodge the billions of dollars that exploration would have needed unless they had the military incentive to do so. And that came from this part of that speech. That's what I submit to you. And by the way, it's the same speech. You guys know Kennedy Space Center. There's his bust right in the front entrance, in the front entrance, and there's that speech. I believe the nation should have... But it, we got plenty of space here on the granite, OK? Hey, where, where's the kill the commies part, right? Kill the commies. Oh, by the way, let's observe. It's not there. They could have fit it, but they didn't, all right? It could have plenty of real estate there. That's the, that's the sort of the cleansing of our memory of that period, thinking that back then they were discoveries. That's all we need to be today. That's the only thing that stands between us and returning to Mars that is delusional. Not only that, we have a serious personnel issue, all right? Let's, let's look at some major things that were done. I'm sorry, the text is small. I'll, I'll, I'll get you through it. It'll be quick. Uh, national origins of SciTech innovators, all right? I broke it up into that. We can make a much bigger list than this. This is handpicked. Countries primarily responsible for radar, England, subsequent leadership from the United States, previous investments in radio technology. Uh, who broke the German code? England, basically, using their scientists, mathematicians, and engineers. The Manhattan Project, okay, the bomb, that's us. We paid for that. But you know what I'm saying? We didn't have the intellectual foundations to pull this off. So we gathered all the efforts of these folks. And let's see where they're born. Germany, Denmark, Germany, Italy. Oh, there's a USA. Germany, Oh uh, No, he's born here, but he went to Germany to get his PhD, okay? Germany, Italy, Hungary, Hungary. And so the only sort of full-blooded American educated person here is Arthur Compton. Now, of course, not all of them were specifically on the Manhattan Project, but they had science that contributed to it. My point is that the Manhattan Project is vaporware without the contributions made by international expertise. And lately, our country, America, has been so jingoistic about its presence in the world, we are closing off future, the, the chances of there being any future fertility in international cooperation for any what, what might be our future needs. All right? I don't know that we can do this today, particularly given the state of science education in America as we know it. Let's go back to landing men on the moon. Well, it was America, of course. But we had to, like, capture Werner von Braun. All right? All right? Here he comes from Berlin, Germany. And where do we put it? We put him in Huntsville, Alabama. Okay? So we say, 
go, get us into space. So, um, there's one you always hear, here's one. And, you know, I, I, used to, I, I used to be all robot, okay? I'm an academic, if you're a pure academic, you're a robot person. And I understand, I feel that. I, I'm with the robot people out there. However, there's a reality check that is long in the coming. I only have like five more slides, I'm sorry. You, well, I'm sorry. Will you give me five minutes? Okay. Actually, I have more than five, but they go really quick. I promise, okay? <laughs> I promise. I promise. The, the last 40 slides will take 30 seconds, okay? Fine, okay. <laughs> so, man versus robot. So, just like yesterday or the day before, uh, one of our favorite physicists, Steven Weinberg, um, of course a Nobel laureate, one in a long tradition of Nobel laureates who comments slightly outside of his specific expertise, um, Caltech is not immune to that fact. I think Linus Pauling uh, was on the faculty here, and he became Mr. Vitamin C, I think. Um, so, here we go. This is like last week or two days ago. International Space Station is an, orb is an orbital turkey. I happen to like turkey, so I didn't immediately view this as something bad that he was saying, but I had to realize, I'd look it up, turkey means bad in this context. No important science has come of it. I can almost say no science has come out of, uh, what's that over here? Uh, no science has, no, no important science has come out of it. I can almost say no science has come out of it. I'll go beyond that and say the whole man's program is so enormously expensive, a fraction of even the seven-tenths of a dollar, uh, has produced nothing of scientific value. Okay, uh, uh, human beings don't serve any useful function in space, apart from servicing the Hubble telescope, but that's, uh, that's missing from this assessment. Um, the most famous scientific instrument there ever was was serviced by astronauts. You know, when Hubble was going to be cut, and maybe said, we're not going to do the servicing mission, the loudest people out there were not the scientists. It was not NASA. It was the public. There were op-eds and talk shows, and everybody say, save Hubble, save Hubble. And we, we, I, I'd never seen the public take ownership of a scientific experiment before. That's extraordinary. I mean, Hubble had worked its way into the hearts and minds of the public. And you don't get that just by launching and then going extinct after five years. That... It worked that way because Hubble's been up for 17 years. There were kids in school coming of age whose entire life in the, in the academic pipeline has been exposed to the fruits of the Hubble telescope. It is a cultural icon. Uh, they radiate heat. They're expensive to keep alive. It's all, okay. And they want to come back, all right? So right? <laughs> most robots are okay. The rovers on Mars, not, they'll be fine, all right? You leave them there. But this, this, he goes on. I don't even want to dwell on this. He just goes on, okay? He goes on and on and on. Uh, uh, this is, at the same time, NASA's budget is increasing with the increase being driven by what he sees uh, on the part of the president and the administrators of NASA as an infantile fixation on putting people into space, which has little or no scientific value. So my point here is the following. If you look at, we in the academic community have this delusion that NASA is our private science funding agency. That's how we view NASA. But it has never been that. If you look at the history of this funding, I'm sorry I don't have another line on here, ask, where's the line that is the percent of this total given unto science? Back then it was like 10%. It's been slowly growing, you know, it hit 20% up here in the 80s, and now it's about a third or a little less, 30%. But most of this money was never directed to science, not since it was born. So to think or require that NASA all of a sudden wake up one day and say, oh, we've been wrong all these years, let's put it all into science. If you take it out of the MAN program, there is no guarantee it'll go to science. This is the delusion of budget numbers when seen by a person who does not leave their academic confines and do a tour of duty in Washington. It's not zero sum. It's not take it out of this fraction, put it in that fraction. It doesn't work that way. The MAN program, yes, it's hugely expensive in this, by these measures, but it's spread across the whole country creating voting representatives 
who vote NASA's budget. And so the stability of NASA is fundamentally connected to the fact that you have centers across the country that care about what NASA does because the man program is a fundamental part of it. Not only that, human emotion, human emotion is such that I don't think anyone's ever going to name a high school after a robot. Okay? It doesn't work. It just doesn't work that way. Again, I'm just the messenger here. And so people say, well, people love the, the rovers. They love the rovers. They, love, they can what? Yes, that's true. Yes. Yes. Uh, the, the rovers, um, particularly the first one, Sojourner, and the other one that followed it, what was it? Oh, the Spur and Opportunity. But before then, uh, Sojourner. What came after Sojourner? Pathfinder. Pathfinder. Was it Pathfinder or was it Spirit and Opportunity when the website, the JPL website, if I remember this correctly, I could get it wrong. I know you're filming this, and so I, so this could be wrong information. But I th I'm told, but <laughs> I'm told this has, it's at least somewhat accurate, that the number of hits that came to the JPL website monitoring the rovers for the two weeks after they landed and which people, exceeded the total world traffic in internet pornography. Is that a correct statement? That is a correct statement, okay. So, if your rovers are, <laughs> if people are looking at your rovers and not naked things around the world, you're doing good, I think. That's a good sign. So, 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 so the, the populated robots is undeniable. But remember that human beings are not breaching any exploration frontiers at the same time. I would bet you, I would bet you that if you had people on their way to Mars while the rovers were there, the rover website would go unremarked upon. The evidence is already there because it happened that way in the 60s. Most people don't know that there were robots on the moon before the astronauts got there. Time magazine, Life magazine didn't write articles about those. They were tracking the, the original seven Mercury astronauts. They were tracking the Gemini because every next mission was, was an advancement on the previous one which gave the media something to talk about. The moment you stop breaching that frontier, the media loses interest, not because they don't care about manned space, but because manned space is not giving them something to care about. That's a fundamental difference that has not been recognized by the naysayers of the manned program. In fact, science is piggybacking the manned program as it always has been, and I, I have not been given reason to presume that that will ever change. Is it a new problem? 1969, a letter from Donald Wyeth, chief scientist and deputy director of the Apollo Lunar Exploration Office to Homer Newell, associate administrator of NASA. Here's a letter. It's a resignation letter. Why is he resigning? 1969. The following is a discussion of the reasons behind my resignation. As chief scientist and deputy director of Apollo Lunar Explor is that word again, Exploration Office, I came to the agency because the advisory boards to NASA, on which I sat, seemed to have little influence on the manned lunar program. After working inside the system to give science a more effective voice, I became convinced that the system was equally refractory to internal scientific advice. Uh, I don't know that we would use this word today. This is like the, from the, the list of polite words that people used in the 60s. It um, uh, might have said, today you might have said, was equally uh, ignored, or there would have been a blunter word rather than just, but I'm okay with adjectives born of science, right? Refractory. <laughs> That's good. Well, this is good. It's a whole bunch. I watched a number of basic management decisions be made, shifting priorities, funds, and manpower away from maximiz maximizing exploration of the present Apollo system towards the development of large new manned space system. It's not a new problem. It's been going on forever. Don't pretend like it's something new, some new way NASA's operating. So all I can say is my read of the history of this is when you have a healthy man program, even if money switches back and forth, science is riding its back. It's there. Even if it's not as much as you want it to be, and even though NASA isn't just only listening to us, we the academics, the fact is it's enabled at all in the first place. Uh, so this goes on. So, Anyhow, so then he goes up and signs it. It seemed that the system and priorities were not likely to change significantly in the near future until such time as the administrator, together with the associate administrator, determined that science is a major function of the manned space program and is to be supported with adequate manpower and funds. Any other scientist in my vacated position would be likely to expend his time futilely. 
and a resignation letter. And I credit John Locke to him for calling this letter to my attention. So the lesson here is wonderment is not enough of a driver. The next frontier, nope. It's in all the literature of space enthusiasts. It just does not work in Washington. It doesn't work in any civilization that has ever come about. Great nations do it, the calling. It's all baloney. It's all baloney. All of this. All of this. It never, including that. Yes, we have a funding threshold. Hubble was a billion dollars a year, whatever. We, in, when you're a wealthy nation, you've got a threshold that works. You can do a billion dollar mission. Can you do a $10 billion mission? I don't know. That seems like it's above our threshold. Did we build the super collider? No. No, because there wasn't a weapon at the end of the super collider. There weren't diamond mines at the end of the super collider. We didn't see the face of Jesus at the end of the super collider. Okay? So the budget flinched. The budget flinched. The whole project gets cut. I wasn't surprised. All right, now for the fast photos. You ready? 40 pictures in two minutes. You ready? All right. And then we're going to end in this set of photos. This is just pictures. You don't have to read a thing. You ready? This is a, a bad image of what is in a museum uh, listed as the very first ice skates ever, at least the oldest extant pair of ice skates. And you say, well, isn't that quaint? Oh, look at that with the leather strap. Oh, isn't that cute? You go to modern times, and it's like, hey, this is what, this is what we got going now, new materials. And so the first of its kind looks quaint. And the modern one is the modern one, and that's the one we will drool over. This continues onward. This is the very first cell phone, OK? <laughs> uh, in fact, in the, in the movie uh, Wall Street, uh, Gecko is on the beaches of the Hamptons, and he's got one of these. Not quite that size, but it's almost that big. And I remember seeing that and saying, wow, boy, I want a phone like that one day where I can just walk around. It's like, no, I don't. Not anymore. <laughs> yes. Get that thing quickly to a museum. And I had a slide in here of the, the latest BlackBerry to contrast this with, but I realized, why, why do I do it when I own, you know, I got the new, the new, the new iPhone. So uh, while on the airplane, I prepared this slide. <laughs> okay, okay. So, so we, so we go from this to that. All right. It's just huge. It's a, it's huge. Okay. The very first car. This is Carl Benz, the first internal combustion engine. They had steam cars back then, but that doesn't count. It's not a precursor to today's industry. How quaint. Put it in a museum, but give me. This, OK? This is a very high speed Mercedes Benz, OK? Uh, let's keep going. The first airplane, oh, how quaint, OK? Let's put that in one of our museums in Washington. That's so cute. And you fast forward, and planes have gotten really different since then. Uh, here's one, OK? Now, this thing looks like an anaconda that swallowed a pig. And I, 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 I don't know if I'm OK walking into this thing. But if you showed this to the Wright brothers, they would go apoplectic, right? So it's not only did you get big, but you have things like you know, the Concord, beautiful lines. This is still a, a sight to behold, even though it's not flying anymore. Fine, we'll get back to that in a minute. Then we get Robert Goddard, the first rocket, first liquid-fueled uh, rocket. OK, there we go, fine. And we go forward. There's a Delta taking off, fully strapped with all its SRBs. I don't remember where this one was going. Anybody recognize its patches? Uh, whatever it is with these many SRBs, it's going far. Or if it's not going far, it's going fast. Right? <laughs> oh, I guess it's a near mission. That must be it. Of course, duh. duh. Um, <laughs> near Earth asteroid rendezvous for those who, um, who are not plugged in. Uh, how about like the first like supersonic plane, early supersonic planes? Back then, that would have looked really sleek. And now it's kind of put it in a museum as fast as you can. And then you come up to this. All right. I'm a little worried because this. This is from vintage from the 70s, but it still looks cool. You want to be in this thing. But why does it still look cool? We'll get back to that in just a moment. So first, crystal radio, or a very early version of a crystal radio. And here is an XM, a portable, fist-sized, palm-sized XM radio talking up to the satellites, getting your music on you know, 200 channels. Uh, this is 1929, uh, one of the earliest uh, tube televisions. There it is. Uh, now, of course, we have big old flat panels. We don't, we don't even call them TVs anymore. They're just monitors, and you hand them a signal. So those have come a long way. Here, we, this, I think this is the ENIAC or the UNIAC. I get them mixed up. All right, there it goes. And of course, um, this is an early sort of uh, PC with buttons. And t uh, this is the first mouse. 
the very first mouse. All this looks quaint, and there's a point to all of this. I'm not just wasting your time, I promise. Or I don't think I'm wasting your time. It's for you to decide. There's the first mouse made out of somebody's, you know, you know, it looks like a boat, boat wood or something. And then you get to like an early, uh, there's the early Macintosh from 1984. Um, it looks quaint. It looks quaint, and you get to sort of a modern day sleek uh, machine. Okay? The, all the early ones look quaint. So now we get the first spacecraft to take us to the moon. Okay? And then you look at that spacecraft, the Saturn V, of course, on the ground. I think this is at Huntsville. Uh, I don't know if you knew this, but it's 36 stories tall. So you put it on the ground, and there's a human being walking next to it. You say, okay, does that look quaint to any of us? No, it doesn't. In fact, when you walk past this, you have the urge to genuflect by it. Because you say, how the hell did we accomplish this? How did we do What? Look at this thing. Look at the size of the five engines. And you say to yourself, my gosh, can we do this ever again? And the problem is, when we see the Saturn V rocket, we don't say, oh, isn't that quaint? Let's put it in a museum. We're not saying that today. And we're not saying it because we haven't advanced past this. Yes, the space shuttle is advanced. But in terms of a space frontier, in terms of where you're going today, we don't have anything as powerful as this was. So we still look at this like the monkeys in the monolith in 2001 as you come up to it. And this is what the people do. Because you can't believe what this is. Or excuse me, they're apes and the monolith, okay? And so, so I submit to you, I submit to you that the big challenge today is not to only look backwards and look at the Saturn V and genuflect in front of it. It's to say, let us, let us work in such a way so that the Saturn V rocket looks quaint. That should be our goal, because every other first thing in the world, no one is putting on the covers of their magazines, all right? Like the, you are in the Space Enthusiast magazines. Everybody's looking back to the 60s, reminiscing about how things once were, rather than understanding the funding drivers and understanding what it takes and what it may take and what it may never happen. I'm going to be candid and tell you, it may never happen to allow the next generation of space exploration to look back at that picture and say, oh, look at it in that cute. Look at this is what they used to get to the moon. And look at what we have now. And I'm waiting for something to show up there. Thank you. I'm sorry to take all of your time. Thank you. <laughs>